CLT OTC. Clear caution, warning memory, verify no unexpected errors. By the year 2000, only 5% of the Earth's surface was mapped using high-resolution imagery. In February 2000, the National Imagery and Mapping Agency collaborated with NASA on a revolutionary mission to collect high-resolution data from more than 80% of the Earth's surface. This is their story. Booster ignition and liftoff of Space Shuttle Endeavour on a 21st century mission placing Earth back on the map. NASA and NEMA partnered together to have the Space Shuttle Endeavour launch on a mission on February 11th, 2000 to do near global mapping of the Earth. When you look at what NEMA was going to use the product for, a very large contribution to our geospatial intelligence is elevation data of the world. We called it digital terrain elevation data. DTED is a gridded elevation product and prior to SRTM, most of the collection that existed was at level one of DTED and that has roughly 100 meter post spacing on the ground. What SRTM offered was the ability to collect these data at a 30 meter post spacing, which is uh, over three times more dense than what had existed before. The data was amazing because it was fairly uniform. It was collected over nine days, whereas our previous DTED comes from a lot of different sources and it was not uniform. There's an enormous number of applications where you need to know the shape of the train. And I personally believe that this mission will quite possibly be the most single significant mission we ever have or ever will fly in space because a map that everybody on the Earth can take advantage of is just enormously valuable. Mapping the Earth's surface at a higher resolution was not a new idea. In fact, efforts to collect a DTED Level 2 date back to the 1970s. Unable to penetrate cloud coverage using cameras and satellites, experts chose radar as the optimal technological solution for mapping the Earth. I joined SRTM before it was a NEMA mission. I was involved in the uh, activity that selected SRTM. Uh, it was called the DTED Panel Working Group. We were looking at competing technologies that could satisfy a worldwide need for high resolution terrain elevation data. We looked at about 20 different technologies from across government, industry, and academia. And SRTM was determined to be the lowest risk, highest probability success opportunity to collect those data. Defining the terms of partnership between NEMA and NASA also presented some initial challenges for greenlighting the project. It was probably about a year, year and a half before the shuttle actually flew that I got involved in two issues that were critical to the beginning of the mission. The issue was where is the money going to come from? Uh, without money and without a data release plan, NASA would not agree to fly the mission. Although we were planning for it, we had not programmed specifically for the mission to fly in that fiscal year. And so I provided a legal analysis about why we could pull money from different pots, put it together to cover the mission costs for NEMA. But they were having trouble closing a memorandum of agreement with NASA about uh, data release. NASA came back to, to NEMA and said, look, we've got a launch window here. We have a mission that could be available to you to do this. Let's try to make it happen. Both organizations knew the mission had to find a way to proceed. Ultimately, NEMA Director, Lieutenant General James King, agreed to NASA's terms for releasing parts of the SRTM data to unclassified partners in academia and industry. I would talk to General King practically on a, on a daily basis. I would explain to him from time to time where we were in the negotiations, and he finally realized that we have to give them something. And he was a proponent of release of data. And he also understood uh, fundamentally how important the SRTM data was to not just NEMA's National Defense and Intelligence mission, but also the scientific discovery. Moving the mission forward, Experts designed innovative radar instruments to map the Earth's surface from NASA's shuttle, the Endeavour. It was a very unique mission. It was going to use a modified radar that would require the Space Shuttle Endeavour to fly upside down. 
deploy a boom 60 meters out into space and at the same time be able to keep the stability it needed to map the Earth's surface. To get a three-dimensional map, you have a radar in the bay and a radar out on a long boom so that you get a stereoscopic effect. That's how you get the 3D measurements. And this long boom was deployed while I was asleep. So I got up and, of course, went flying up to the flight deck to see how everything had gone. And the mast was in the bright sunlight. It was just gorgeous. And I was so excited to see that, that it had all gone out and we were ready to start mapping. The Endeavour's 60-meter mast made it the largest object flown in space. Maintaining a precise orbit with an object of this size required a unique movement called the fly casting maneuver. This maneuver ensured the Endeavour's orbital position maximized data collection, resulting in fewer gaps of imagery over specific locations of the Earth's surface. What the fly casting maneuver involved was the shuttle commander blipping the engines to just cause the shuttle to move forward a tiny bit, wait for that arm to swing back, and then start to swing forward again. Once it reached a mark that they had made in the window of the shuttle, then they did the orbit adjust once the, the arm caught up uh, with the movement of the shuttle. <laughs> you know, <laughs> amazing. You know, the astronauts were afraid everything was going to fall out. They, 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 the NEMA-NASA partnership was crucial for mission success. Teammates from both organizations worked side by side in NASA's mission control room. The NEMA and the SRTM team of NASA will join together to form a very tight partnership. Both of them saw the need for the mission. During the actual mission, we worked at Johnson Space Center. We had two teams of personnel um, at JSC. We had one team in the Payload Operation Control Center, or the POC as it was known, and then we had one in the mission control room. During the mission, we were on a series of voice loops where we could listen to what was going on with various systems on the shuttle. During the 11-day flight, the Endeavour encountered a few challenges that nearly compromised the mission's success. One of them was being able to perform orbit adjust during the shuttle mission because gravity will pull on that deployed boom and then require more propellant to be consumed. To overcome that, they created this cold gas system and they snaked this tube down the mast of the shuttle and then they were going to expel gas at a very low pressure out the end of it to combat the forces of gravity. Unfortunately, what was not accounted for was the adiabatic expansion of gas, which caused that line to freeze very soon after the mission began. And as a result of that, that system failed. So there was concern that the mission would need to be terminated early because of the lack of propellant to maintain orbital control of the shuttle. One of the other interesting aspects of the shuttle mission was the retraction of the mast at the end of the mission. The deployment of the mast went very smoothly, but the retraction of it was not quite as smooth. I was on duty when we tried to, to stow the mast, and the mast stopped about three inches short of fully stowing, and we couldn't bring it home unless it was fully stowed. All the cabling inside of that arm had frozen during the mission. So they couldn't get the entire uh, arm retracted back into the canister. You either have to throw it overboard, do a spacewalk, something to get it stowed. The ground team is working like mad to come up with alternate solutions for us. And sure enough, we tried four different things. And on the fourth attempt, it, it closed like it was supposed to. Despite these challenges, the mission was a complete success. On February 22, 2000, the Endeavour touched down at Kennedy Space Center. But SRTM did not end there. Over the next few years, NEMA validated and calibrated the imagery for eventual release to public partners. For several reasons, SRTM remains a critical part of our agency's and our nation's history. For the first time, over 200 military systems that relied on elevation data now had more accurate information that allowed them to create three-dimensional models and to be able to have the specifics that were needed for 
programming, the global positioning systems, and other things that would be used. To be able to collect 80%, which is what the SRTM mission did, was tremendous. The SRTM program was revolutionary in the data that it provided. To watch out the window as all of this earth goes by and know that we're mapping all of this for all those people to help them better live and grow crops and deal with the weather is just was just really exciting and special. And it was just really, really exciting and I was really proud to be a part of that, that activity. It was truly a success story and one that made us not only be able to support the military intelligence community, but other areas in the academic and civil world that needed the same type of information to protect American lives.